Om Jnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaiva Chapatita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're studying Bhakti Vaibhav Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, chapter number 10 today. Is it chapter 10? Right? So let me go to the PowerPoint. Let's see. Share the screen. Everyone okay? Can see the PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. good. Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. Looks like. Okay. Lesson number two. Departure of Lord Krishna for Dwarka. So we began the chapter and we covered this first section about uh, how Sutta Goswami replied to Sonakarishi's question. You remember Sonakarishi wanted to know how did Maharaj Yudhisthira rule because he was very disturbed after the battle of Kurukshetra. He, he couldn't even eat. He didn't have appetite for his food. He, he was not taking his food. He was feeling so guilty. So we heard how Maharaj Yudhisthira ruled and how the, the whole planet became very prosperous. Everyone was satisfied. Everyone was taken care of. It was a very nice situation under the rule of Maharaj Yudhisthira. So today we're going to go on and speak about Lord Krishna's departure for Dwarka. Remember we heard in Kunti's prayers, she was uh, torn between the two. Should Krishna go to Dwarka because he has his family there or should he stay in Hastinapur where his relatives are? And we'll hear about the ladies of Hastinapur and how they appreciate Lord Krishna and how Lord Krishna responds to their prayers. So there's uh, three sections in this chapter. We'll hope we'll complete this chapter today. So Lord Krishna has very nice relationships with the Pandavas. Maharaj Yudhisthira, like his older brother, at the same time Maharaj Yudhisthira knows that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But Lord Krishna takes pleasure when his devotees accept him as less important in terms of love. Lord Krishna takes pleasure in this uh, wonderful intimacy, in the intimacy, intimate dealings which uh, he enjoys between his devotees. 
We could have, maybe you'd like to give some other examples of where Krishna enjoyed being in the subordinate position to his devotees. Yes? Some hands? Some very obvious ones? Yes? Who's, whose hands are up? Early Manohar. Middle Manohar Prabhu. Hare Krishna, thank you, Raj. I was thinking uh, specifically of um, Mavya Soda finding Krishna. Right. Yeah, that's the, the one which immediately comes to mind. And we know that Lord Krishna, in the Damodar prayers, how is it described? It's described that this uh, dealing between Mother Yasoda is more pleasing to Krishna than. The prayers of the Vedas, isn't it? Some Right, yeah, the, the recitation of the Vedic mantras. Okay, thank you Prabhu. And any, you have some other examples, some other hands are up, maybe different ones? Vinay Damodar Prabhu's got his hand up. Krishna, he drove the chariot of Arjuna. Lord Krishna becomes the chariot driver of Arjuna, so he takes the subordinate position. You know, what, what ha well, we hear in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, uh, uh, Arjuna is telling Krishna, all right, take my chariot into the middle of the battlefield. I want to see who is assembled here. And so although Lord Krishna is the supreme controller, he's taking instruction from his devotee. He's become the servant of his devotee. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. No. Thank you, Prabhu. And, uh, uh, any more examples? Mahavir Rupa, Prabhu, as he ended. Okay, Mahavir Rupa, Prabhu. Mahavir Rupa, Prabhu. You're not very clear, Prabhu. Could you do something about your microphone there? Okay, uh, am, I, am I clear now? A little better. Okay, Lord Krishna put, why? Because uh, there was a loving uh, relationship, he wanted to respect, to show uh, respect uh, to his father and uh, there was a loving relationship in a paternal relationship, so in the paternal relationship father uh, was given respect by Lord Krishna. Okay, thank you. All right. We still have one hand up, Chandrika Maharaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, may, maybe we can say uh, Sandipani Muni, the spiritual master of uh, Krishna. Sandipani Muni gives initiation or gives instruction to Lord Krishna. All right, yes, why not? Krishna comes, is, comes to the school, Gurukul, Sandipani Muni in Avantipur, or now it's called Ujjain. Krishna and Balaram came there. How long did they stay there in the Gurukul of Sandipari Muni? Anyone uh, 64 days. 64 days, yes. Two, two months, just over two months. And what did they learn? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 64 arts, okay. <laughs> of course, Lord Krishna doesn't need to learn anything. Why did he go then to the Guruku? To show example. Yes, right. He teaches by, he wants to show the example 
that we should all study, we have to study, we have to take shelter from a spiritual master, we have to take instruction. Okay, so there are many nice examples where Lord Krishna takes pleasure in subordinating himself before his devotees. Okay, so Lord Krishna is preparing to leave, but he's approached by Maharaj Yudhisthira, he's approached by the Pandavas, they, they cannot bear him to leave them. They've been associating with him. Of course, he's been with them in the battle of Kurukshetra. And the thought of him leaving them is unbearable to him. Having got the association of the Lord, they don't like to lose it. But Srila Prabhupada explains here, the Lord being absolute, however, Separation from him is as good as personal contact. His remembrance by his form, quality, name, fame, pastimes, etc. is also attractive for the pure devotees. So much so that he forgets all forms, qualities, name, fame and activities of the mundane world. So this is a, a nice point that we want to get free of maya, we're, you know, we're, we're, we, we become absorbed in the thought of maya as described here, the name, fame, form, fame, activities of the mundane world. How to get rid of these thoughts of the mundane world? We have to fill our mind with thoughts of Lord Krishna. We have to practice remembering Krishna. So this is the process of Krishna Consciousness, chanting the holy name, discussing the qualities and pastimes of the Lord. And when we fill our mind with thoughts of Krishna, then we cannot think of the mundane world. So when, when we're remembering the Lord, then we will not feel the separation from Him, because by remembering His qualities, will be able to associate. So, due to his mature association with other pure devotees, he is not out of contact with the Lord for a moment. Due to his mature association with other pure devotees, he is not out of contact with the Lord. In the association of devotees, devotees will naturally discuss topics of Krishna. Right? There's a famous verse in the third canto from Kapila Shiksha, Satam prasangam mamavirya sambhado avanti ritkarana rasayanakta. The topics of Lord Krishna, when heard in the association of pure devotees, are very pleasing to the ear and to the heart. So in the association of pure devotees, there will be discussions of, about Krishna. When we come for association, that is the real business of association. Neophyte devotees sometimes they have difficulties understanding this, that we come together not to discuss the home or the family, or the climate, or the politics, but we come to discuss topics of Krishna. So in the association of devotees, our only business is to talk about Krishna. And in that way, we won't feel any separation. Rather, we'll feel the presence of Lord Krishna with us. Okay, so here's beautiful painting of Lord Krishna and you can see how he is being escorted. This is, of course, uh, this is the reception. We'll be discussing this later. It doesn't come up right now. I don't know how that slide got in there. Okay, so 
Here's a quote from one of Prabhupada's purports here. Prabhupada's talking about topics of Krishna. He says, just like we are presenting so many books about Krishna, simply we have tried to explain Krishna with all these translations. Nothing but Krishna. How to understand Krishna. So here it is called Sarva Shruti Manohara. Krishna is very pleasing to hear. Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. This actually comes up in relation to uh, topics. Uh, the, the ladies of Hastinapur describing topics of Krishna and it's described to be more attractive than the, the Vedic hymns. Right? Why would topics of Krishna be, why would the topics of Lord Krishna chanted by the Hastinapur ladies be more attractive than the Vedic hymns chanted by the Brahmanas? So it's described here that Krishna is Sarva Shruti Manohara. It is very pleasing to hear about Krishna. Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. So when we talk about Krishna, there's no difference between talks, talks about Krishna and Krishna himself. There's great pleasure in talking about Krishna, topics of Krishna. So we get so much pleasure in reading the Krishna book. We've been reading it for so many years, but it's never dry. It's never wasted. I was listening the other day, you know, that um, the Minister of Education, Tapana Mishra Prabhu, has this program where he has uh, interviews different senior devotees and they talk about the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books. Are you also listening to those interviews? Any of you? I didn't know they even exist. Hmm? Nobody listening? I, I didn't know they exist, these interviews. Oh, really? Oh, you're missing out. Every week they're posted on the internet, every week, regularly. And he's interviewed a number of senior devotees. So just the, the last week there, he interviewed Devamrita Swami. And Devamrita Swami made a nice point. Because Tapana Mishra Prabhu brought up the topic, he said, you know, people say, oh, I read the book, there's nothing new, you know, it's the same, I've read it before, there's nothing new. And so Devan Rita Swami brought out the point, he said, you have to understand that reading Prabhupada's books, it's not just to get information. You know, sometimes people think there's nothing new, they just, they're just collecting information. But he said, it's not so much the information which is, which is important. He said, what's important is transformation. <laughs> you know, and I thought this is a really good point, you know, because we do have that tendency sometimes we think, oh, there's nothing new, you know, I, I didn't get anything out of it that new. But he makes the point that reading Prabhupada's books is it's not just to gather points of information. You want to tr transform, it's transformation which is important. And by hearing about Krishna and discussing Krishna, you can really feel the spiritual potency. We actually transform our consciousness. Our mind becomes purified by hearing about Lord Krishna. It's great solace for the mind. So it's very good. I encourage you, you know, you want to find out these interviews and try to listen to them. I'm sure they're all stored there on the internet somewhere. I think it's maybe under what, strategic planning or something. I think called Books of the Basis. And he, he talks about reading, the importance of reading, because, you know, we have this, this, this ongoing thing, encouraging the devotees to read. Because if a devotee will develop a, the habit of reading Prabhupada's books, 
then they will never go away from Krishna consciousness. It's very important. Over the years, you see so many people come and it's so sad when they go because you work so hard to bring people into Krishna consciousness and if it, after some time they go away, Prabhupada used to speak about it, he said, we shed gallons of blood to make one devotee. And if they go away, then it's such a shame. So how to keep them in Krishna consciousness? So it's very important that they, they get a taste for reading Prabhupada's books. It's not, you know, that people talk about distribute Prabhupada's books. Distribute books, very good. Oh, okay, nothing against it. But if they don't read them themselves, <laughs> then what's the good? You know, it's very, very important that to actually understand the importance of distributing Prabhupada's books, you have to read them. And that's why, you know, having these classes like what we're doing, studying Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav, it's really helpful for us to increase our reading and to get us to really absorb our mind in thinking carefully about this philosophy. Okay? So this was Prabhupada's lecture. He's in London. Must be maybe Bhaktivedanta Manor. He said, when we get out, when we get our attachment for hearing about Krishna, then at least we can consider that we have become free from material contamination. When we get attachment simply for hearing Krishna, nothing else, all nonsense, then you should understand you have become liberated. Oh, very nice. We haven't got Krishna Prem yet, but <laughs> liberation is the beginning. Hmm. Our devotional service really begins on the liberated platform. So we have to get this attachment simply for hearing. So important. Lord Chaitanya gave so much emphasis on hearing, right? Do you remember? When did Lord Chaitanya give emphasis on hearing? Have you studied this? Anybody? Where does, in Bhagavad Gita, where does Krishna talk about hearing, the importance of hearing? You've all studied Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti Shastri. Do you remember? Krishna speaking about hearing? Yes? Satchitanai das. Sachitanai Das has raised his hand. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, regarding um, is just my mind and I have one doubt. That's why I have raised my hand. Can I? Okay. What's your doubt? Uh, it's written Gautama. Gautama means uh, Kripacharya. Right? Huh? Huh? What? In Test 9 and 10, it's, it's written Gautama. Gautama, the translation is Kripacharya. Okay. Right. So, Kripacharya is the same who was uh, fighting uh, the side of uh, Kaurava. Yes. Guru of uh, Kaurava. Yes. So, my question is, uh, in what circumstances uh, Krupacharya uh, didn't get any punishment? He was fighting from other side and he was uh, witness also uh, during the uh, Draupadi's Vastraharan time and he was fighting against the Pandava. But uh, everybody almost in Kaurava side got uh, punishment. But Kripacharya didn't get any punishment and he again joined the Pandavas uh, as Kulguru. So, can you please elaborate? Oh, I don't, you're going back there. This is...
This is the, the previous chapter really, isn't it? Okay. Well, I'll think about it. <laughs> I don't know offhand. Anybody has any suggestions about this? Any comments? What, what was the question? Kripacharya is asking about Kripacharya. He said Kripacharya was present when Draupadi was being dis, dis, disrobed. He didn't do anything to stop. And Kripacharya was fighting in Kurukshetra war. He was fighting against Pandavas. Well, Kripacharya is guru, right? He's a, he's a guru. And so, maybe he wasn't a great fight. Maybe he wasn't so much trouble for the Pandavas that he managed to stay out of it. Dronacharya, he was big, he was really fighting and he was really killing. So they had a hard time against Dronacharya, he had to be killed. But we don't hear about Kripacharya much in the battle of Kurukshetra. We don't hear about him being involved. He doesn't have a very prominent position. So because he's not very prominent, he didn't get punished. That's one way of seeing it. Maybe, but his sister, Creepy, is that right? His sister is, or his daughter is Creepy. She was the mother of Ashwatthama. What was the relationship there? The mother of Ashwatthama, what's her name? Creepy. Hmm? Creepy. Creepy, right? She's, what's her relationship with Kripacharya? Sister. Is it sister? Sister. Maybe. Yes. So there's punishment there. There's disgrace there. But Ashwatthama took the punishment. All right, coming back to our topic, we're talking about the importance of hearing. Lord Chaitanya always gave great emphasis on the importance of hearing. The particular example is there when he met with Ramananda Rai, and he asked Ramananda Rai to give verses, to give a verse from the scriptures about the perfection or the goal of life. Remember that conversation at the Godavari? And Ramananda Rai begins, first of all, he talks about Varnashram Dharma, Lord Chaitanya said, go high, no, that's external, don't go higher. And then he talked about Karmarpana, offering the fruits of our work. Lord Chaitanya said, go higher. And then he spoke about Swadharma Tiag, Lord Chaitanya said, keep going. And then he spoke, he gave a verse about uh, Jnana Mishra Bhakti, and Lord Chaitanya said, keep going. And then finally he came up with a verse from the 10th canto, which spoke about hearing. That one should hear, stay, that, you know, that stane stita shruti gatan tan van manobir, Prabhupada often quotes, that you stay in your position. You don't have to change your situation. You stay whatever ashram you're in and you hear about Krishna. And in this way you conquer Krishna. So that's there. That was what Lord Chaitanya said, yes, this is pure devotional service. He said, now discuss this. So this, this is the example how Lord Chaitanya emphasized hearing. Similarly, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna spoke the, the yoga ladder. At the end of the sixth chapter, the yoga ladder was described. Yogi nam apisarvicham madgatena antaratmanam, right? Of all yogis, the highest yogi is the one who's in devotion. Then chapter 7 begins, right? Lord Krishna says, now hear from me, O Arjuna, how by practicing yoga 
in full consciousness of me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. So, hearing, Prabhupada explained, this is the beginning of the devotional process. Shravanam, we have to hear before we can chant. So, hearing is always emphasized. You have to hear, you have to hear regularly because we want to strengthen our creeper of devotion, strengthen our faith, our our consciousness of Krishna. So we get that by hearing. And we have to develop this taste for hearing. And just want, we would just want to hear about Krishna. We don't want to hear about anything else. You know, there was a person called Ganta Kurn. Did, did you know Ganta Kurn? Ganta is a bell and Kurn is an ear. He put bells on his ear, right? And whenever the devotees would come chanting Hare Krishna and telling people about Krishna, shake his head. <laughs> He'd just shake his head, then he would only hear the bell. He said, I don't want to hear about Krishna. So some people are like that. They don't want to hear about Krishna. They put bells on their ears and shake their head. They don't want to hear Krishna. But the devotee is very eager to hear about Krishna. Very important for us. Okay, uh, well, let me see. I, maybe we'll go to the text because there's not a lot of information here in these PowerPoints. Let me change it to the text. Mm. Okay, can you, can you see this? Are you able to see the text? Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, uh, okay, so. So talking about, we're hearing about separation and Prabhu mentions Kripachari is described there that he's also they're all feel he's also feeling sep, he's also feeling separation from the Lord. So uh, <laughs> somehow he has some affection for the Lord. And Prabhupada talks about the feelings of separation exhibited by different devotees, particularly he speaks about Srimati Radharani and the feelings of the gopis when they came to Kurukshetra and they met with Krishna there. And this is a classic example of the separation between Krishna and the gopis, that they seek Krishna, but they're not able to just go and speak to him. And Krishna's there with all of his wives. Okay, then... Uh, So, Prabhupada then, uh, well, the text goes on to describe more about the glories of the Lord and the, how uh, the separation from the Lord. And in the purport, Prabhupada gives an example here. He said, uh, I've, I've marked it here. Uh, he says, by association with pure devotees and by having them submissively and, and by hearing them submissively, Attachment for material enjoyment becomes slackened. An attraction for hearing about the transcendental activities of the Lord becomes prominent. Once they are, they will go on progressively, without stoppage, like fire in gunpowder. It's a very interesting example Prabhupada's given. I had never heard it before. He says, like fire in gunpowder. You can imagine, you put fire in gunpowder, it's just going to go, right? It's not going to take much time. So that's how our devotion for Krishna should become, that when we develop the real taste for hearing about Krishna, that our consciousness of Krishna will just explode. 
will just become so mad after Krishna, will become so attached to hearing, become so eager to get that association with Krishna. Oh. So we're hearing about the separation from the Lord. They, they looked at him without blinking their eyes and they moved hither and there, thither. So this is real attachment to Krishna. Just like when we go to see the deities. We go to see the deity, you want to we want to really absorb our consciousness in seeing the form of the Lord. All right? Once this relationship is slightly revived, the conditioned soul at once becomes freed from the illusion of material energy and becomes mad after the association of the Lord. So we, we also can associate with Krishna. We associate with Krishna through the deity, through the holy name, through the Bhagavatam. This Bhagavatam is none different from Krishna, right? The question was asked in the first chapter that after Lord, that Lord Krishna, when he's present on the planet, he's the personification of all religious principles. But now he's departed from the world, where are the religious principles found? Right? Who remembers the verse? What's the answer? A translation? After living, after living with Krishna in his own uh, original abode, he left um, the, this Bhagavatam, is, uh, is the uh, knowledge and the uh, he left, after Krishna left to go on his own about the knowledge and the, and the uh, jnana, he's left in Bhagavatam and uh, in Kaliuga, those who have lost their vision due, due to the dense darkness of uh, Kaliuga, they can get the light and knowledge from this Bhagavatam. Right. This Srimad Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun and it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his own abode. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of this age of Kali will get light from this Purana. So Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said, if you read the Srimad Bhagavatam carefully, one day you'll see Krishna in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? So this is what we want. We want to see Krishna in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So going ahead, we hear about the female relatives and their, you know, ladies, they're feeling separation from Krishna. So they want to cry, the, you know, tears will come in their eyes. They could not stop their tears. It's very difficult. They thought the tears would be inauspicious. They thought not very good. But <laughs> difficult for them. I've marked a section directly or indirectly. Anyone who thinks of Krishna, talks of Krishna or worships Krishna becomes attached to him. So for them, the peop these people in Astinapur, they're directly with Krishna. And we are also indirectly with Krishna, you could say, because Krishna is not physically manifest, but we're feeling the presence of Krishna through his, uh, in his pastimes and the association of his devotees and so many other ways. Okay, and going ahead, we, we hear about the different drums which they're playing because the Lord is leaving, so they want to make it auspicious and they're playing the different drums, so many different types of drums and instruments all sounded together. And then text 16 describes that the ladies of the Kurus, they go up onto the top of the palace, smiling with affection and shyness, and they showered flowers upon the Lord. Now usually we shower flowers when people come, 
We don't often shower flowers when they go, <laughs> right? I haven't seen that too often when people are leaving that they shower flowers. But when people come, you know, certainly when Prabhupada would come, we'd welcome Prabhupada, flowers and everything, so, fla so throw flowers on him and everything. There's some beautiful pictures. There's one especially Prabhupada coming to the temple in Paris. And the devotees are out there and they're throwing flowers onto Prabhupada. Very beautiful. So it's a very nice reception. Anyway, the point here is about shyness among the female members. Shyness. And Prabhupada writes here in the purport that shyness is a particular extra natural beauty of the fair sex and it commands respect from the opposite sex. We hope it commands respect from the opposite sex. It's meant to anyway. Only a, a beast would not give proper respect when the women display the quality of shyness. But a civilized human being would have great respect for the, for the ladies when they display the quality of shyness. So I want to hear from you, how can we display the quality of shyness? In what ways? How should the ladies act? What are they supposed to Maybe they're supposed to put their sari over their head like this, you know? Is, is that shyness? <laughs> Prabhupada didn't like that. If the women came with their sari way over their head like that, he said, this is not how you wear your sari. He said, you just put it on top of your head. You know, you don't have to cover your whole face forehead. And so some, sometimes people would go to extreme. So what are some, what do we expect from w women? You know, how many women have we got here today in the class, by the way? How many ladies are here? Yeah, how many ladies are in the class here today? One, two, three, one, two, three, huh? three ladies, is it? There's six. Six? Oh, six ladies. Okay, good. So we've got six ladies to tell us. And we'll hear from the men what they expect, how they expect women to display shyness. And we'll ask the ladies also to tell us how they present themselves, what is their normal behavior in presenting the shyness, because it, it's such an important point. Uh, so maybe we can make some groups, Mariji? Thank you, Yes, we want some. Uh, we can uh, obey what they say, what the men say, but that, and uh, we should uh, give them respect. Respectfully obey. That way. Thank you. The, the, is that Padma speaking or who? No, no. It's Karuna Tara. Oh, Karuna Tara. Oh, okay. Now, Marija, can you, could you just wait? You, maybe we'll put you in groups and you can discuss in groups and come up with some points together that you all agree on. And we'll compare what the men say and what the women say. How many groups do you want me to make, Maharaj? Well, if we have six ladies, uh, maybe that could be maybe two groups, three ladies in each group. And the men, Maharaj? How many men have we got? I have to count, Maharaj. One, two, six. Sixteen. Sixteen. Oh, sixteen. Oh, quite a few. Uh, so three groups. Three groups of ladies, uh, two, two groups of ladies and three groups of men. And just write down some points which you think should be there to present, to preserve the shyness. Is that okay? Yeah?
Raj, I need one minute for making the rooms. Okay. You shouldn't need a lot of time to do this. I think five minutes will be enough. Mahamani Prabhu and Madhumati Mataji, you are in one go, so what should I do? I'm assigning you to the ladies' room, Mataji. Prabhu can keep quiet. <laughs> Let the lady stop. Shampraboo, could you please join the room? Okay, Maharaj, they join the rooms. Thank you. How many minutes, Maharaj? Five. Okay, Maharaj.
Maharaj, two minutes left. Do you want uh, to give any extra time or uh, can you go on with that? Yeah, we'll close the rooms after, after two minutes. They'll join back in 10 minutes. Once they join, I'll let you know. 10 seconds. I 10 think. seconds, okay. Good. Thank you. Everyone's back already, or they need a minute? They, they are back. Okay. So, can we hear from the ladies' group? Let's hear from one ladies' group first. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I am Karuna Tara. Uh, the others chose me, so I wish, uh, I wish to say as according to them. Uh, Prabhuji, actually, ladies showed shyness. How they showed shyness is my was a point. Happy Karuna Tara Mataji. You have to call him as Maharaj. Sorry. Sorry. I'm so sorry, Maharaj. I'm really sorry. Thank you, Mataji. Okay. Uh, our point was how ladies show their shyness towards men. So, uh, first of all was, uh, as others say, don't, they don't talk about the subject, not interested for men, to men. And the second one was, they show respect to men and they listen to them obediently. And then the, this person, they don't mix up freely with men. Uh, most of the time, uh, as they think, it might be, uh, I mean, wrong to uh, to mix up like that. Okay. Okay. So they keep separate and, from the men. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And then, uh, as Prabhupada gave an, and uh, Prabhupada also gave an example to show uh, China towards women. He said, uh, Prabhupada said he considered women. An inspiration towards men, uh, to, uh, like inspiration towards men, and uh, though they might be very powerful, but they try to act low. Like example, he gave uh, Julius Caesar, and uh, like shyness also contributes to chastity by dressing up properly. So they uh, they try to uh, dress up properly. Towards, I mean, in front of men. That way. That what does what does proper dress mean? Like covering your body. Okay, so body should be covered, right. Body, what about the head and the hair? Okay, so the other ladies group, 
do you have any other points or anything you disagree with? Um, no, Maharaj, uh, we would not, we didn't reach there. Karnataka uh, Maharaj is talking about the other group. There are two groups. Group number two, room number two, ladies. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, yeah, most same points. Uh, we were thinking of having the gross way and the subtle things in the behavior. So gross points were like dressing appropriately and uh, there are more details like covering the feet and covering the hair uh, and uh, yeah, in dressing also not tight fitting dresses even if it is covered and uh, no open hair um, and um, and in terms of uh, and also uh, things like there are certain things which uh, can be distracting like a lady shouldn't sleep in front of a man, like a man shouldn't see a woman sleeping, that is not this thing lying down in front of a man like that, the gross ones. And uh, then in terms of uh, subtle, the behavioral aspects, like speaking softly and with compassion and care and love and, uh, uh, and talking only when it is necessary and um, not trying to uh, grab the attention of men, uh, being polite and uh, not trying to get the attention, doing things which is uh, getting the attention. Okay. And, um, yeah, respecting everyone, not just men, everyone. So Prabhupada says like women should behave like mothers so that men can treat them like mother. Oh, very nice. Yes. This, Women should behave like a mother so men can treat them like mothers. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from the Prabhus. We have. From, from room three. Room three, yes. Who's, who's the spokesman for room three? It's sure that. That's sure the numbers on it. Um, <clears throat> Room three had Asaf Prabhu, Dineshwar Prabhu, and Tribanga Prabhu. Janmashtri Prabhu, you are from Room four, Prabhu. Room four, okay. So, so I will speak for, for Room three. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, both points that Mataji just um, just said are very nice. <clears throat> we have um, one one point which is um, which is uh, um, in addition. <clears throat> it's very similar that a, a woman, a chaste woman, um, is not trying to attract the men. Uh, someone brought up the. Um, the modern day offices, how, how a, a woman can stay shy and chaste in the modern day offices. So he said that by, by not um, trying to attract the men's senses. And, um, and also not associating, not associating freely. Yes, ma'am. Not associating freely and not De deliberately trying to attract the men. Yes, correct. And also, you mentioned uh, humility and submissiveness in, in uh, particular cases. You know, could you speak up a bit, Prabhu? Your voice is not very clear. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry I have a sore throat, but still I was chosen to speak. So we also mentioned humility and uh, submissiveness. Um, where submissiveness is, is relevant in certain, uh, in certain cases. All right. The importance of humility and being submissive, not arguing, challenging. Okay. Let's hear from another group. Uh, 
not very. It's getting really close to the mic. Okay, I'm getting uh, closer to the mic. Uh, in the group four, uh, the devotees uh, uh, made uh, very good uh, input for China. They said that uh, women won't dress in a provocative way, uh, which is uh, very common in the modern world, uh, to attract the opposite sex. And uh, as, a, as a devotee or as a, uh, as a civilized person, uh, uh, we will be very much impressed with women who keep our eyes down. Uh, so that that lady will become uh, devotionally attractive. And uh, this kindness has been uh, given as a natural gift by the uh, material nature. And uh, though in modern society uh, there is no discrimination between males and females, they are uh, mixing with each other. So uh, to exhibit kindness, uh, women can interact with other males other than their husband through her husband so that uh, there is no uh, mixing uh, of breed. And uh, that way, uh, she can uh, basically uh, get respect from males because with the women, they don't uh, mix freely with other males and they communicate with, uh, with and through their husband, then it is more respectful for that woman. So, uh, this, these points, uh, they came out. If I missed out any point inadvertently, kindly, I humbly request other devotees to kindly help me. Well, I'm a bit puzzled to hear this, that you say men and women should mix together and it's no problem. But this is not quite the point which is made in the purport. You're saying so long as the husband is there, she can be with the husband, and then she can be with the husband and all the other men. So, Okay, all right, that's what came out in your discussion. Let's hear from the other group. There's one more group. Remember, Prabhu, could you please mute yourself? Group five, Virakopal Prabhu, your group. Whoever is the speaker? No one's coming forward, so I guess by default. I could present the points that pulled up in our group. Um, one point to help um, preserve the chastity or shyness of the ladies is to not unnecessarily force them to speak in public, like give class or come in front. Sometimes I see that where Mataji may be somewhat senior, and so she's sometimes pressured to speak. You know, some ladies find it quite okay but others not, so we should give them the space to maintain that shyness if they don't want to speak in public or in front of the crowd. That's a practical thing I've seen sometimes. Ladies are forced to do that. They find it very um, difficult. Um, also, we mentioned that uh, men should be aware of their roles and the ladies as well in society and shouldn't um, try, we shouldn't overlap. We should be, we should understand the principle of of how men behave and how women behave, of course that's a big subject, but we should be aware of the basic principles. And um, this was also brought up again in our group, um, that there should be um, separation between men and ladies. Uh, Prabhupada mentioned that a few times in his purports. He mentions this is actual culture. And one place I think Prabhupada says that without that, then it's just like animal life. <laughs> Father made that point that there should be um, a separation between men and women as far as possible, I would say. And I uh, also mentioned about we should be careful of modern education. Modern, modern society doesn't imbibe these principles, it imbibes the opposite. So one devotee very nicely brought up that we should, um, ladies should take training from cultured ladies, senior ladies or mothers who come from more cultural background and imbibe the principles of um, how to behave as a lady in society. So if anyone from the group, there's something I missed, you can please 
you want to emphasize something, please, if you can do that. I just wanted to uh, just yes. add, yes. if I may, uh, that um, the men need to protect the women. Sometimes I feel that women have to be stretched to behave in a, uh, a way that is not by default their nature because they don't get the protection. So that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Very nice analysis there. Some very interesting points. I appreciate these, some of these things, especially this point about giving protection. The duty of the man is to protect the woman. And, and sometimes that's why the women don't want to leave the man, you know. And especially you get couples married, you know, and the woman said, no, I have to be with my husband. She doesn't want to leave her husband. And it's a problem. You know, sometimes you have you make arrangements, the men will take prasadam here and the women there. Oh no, I have to be with my husband, you know. <laughs> uh, very tricky situation. But certainly in the temple, we do have the standard, you know, women on one side, men on the other. Although actually it was in some temples like you have the women at the back and the men at the front. And in Los Angeles, Prabhupada told the women they could go up on the balcony and they could be up there <laughs> and they could be at the back rather than at the front and then let the men be in the front. And so the, the separation, the segregation of, of the sexes, of the genders, is, it's, it's, it, it is important. Certainly it is important. We do want to try to encourage that. It's also important, you know, women should be properly, they, they should understand the, the significance of coming before the deity. If they come with their hair untangled, untied and hanging all over their face, all right, you know, they're not initiated, all right, we don't, if they're not initiated, but at least the initiated devotees, those who have taken initiation into Krishna consciousness, they should strictly follow the standards. They should set the right example, the hair tied up and sari over the head, some, some portion. It's important to show that, that the dress does make a difference. And the behavior also, the talking, as Prabhu said, uh, asking women to talk, it's not really something we want to do. We, we definitely don't want to force women to talk. Some women are very good at it. And I think even in Bhaktivedanta Manor today you have a temple president, who you have many temples with women temple presidents, isn't it? In USA? Kind of common. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's three prominent ones in America. Yeah. And Yadavar's um, wife, Ushaka and Manor. Yeah. So we have a few ladies there taking leading roles as managers, administrators. But it's certainly not in India. You wouldn't find that in India, not never. And so in India still we have some semblance of the Vedic culture. But everything, time and place and circumstance. Tamal Krishna Maharaj said that he, 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 Prabhupada had said to him that he would have made Yamuna Maharaji a GBC only she was a woman. So because she was a woman he didn't put her on the GBC. So Prabhupada did see some difference there. And certainly. Uh, that, so the, the, these ladies like uh, Janava Maharaji who was the the, the the guru, after Lord Nityananda departed, she became the Acharya. It's described that she was very shy. She was not prominent. She did not take a big prominent role, but she was certainly spiritually powerful and spiritually pure. And the chastity is a very important part of that, where they get that spiritual potency from. So Prabhupada explains, he said, shyness is a check to the unrestricted mixing. It is nature's gift and it must be utilized. 
so it means we should we sh there should be un there should not be unrestricted mixing we should we should we expect ladies to cultivate the quality of shyness by their dressing by their behavior you know if you get a woman who starts young woman who comes to the kirtan and she starts dancing in a very wild fashion <laughs> you know then it will certainly will create a big uh, kind of upheaval there was they, they told me devotees told me how there was one young woman she came and she started dancing and dancing wildly and her mother came her mother came and grabbed her and threw her out the temple her mother was chased the girl was not but the mother she checked the behavior of the girl she wouldn't allow her daughter to dance wildly and create a big uh, stir in the temple. So, proper behavior from the ladies is important and proper behavior from the men. We have to give protection. The, the, the ladies are under the shelter of the men. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, Well, all right, if it's in relation to the topic. Yes, yes, very much uh, in relation to what um, he spoke about. Um, in men, about, the, you know, about what you're talking about, the kids and, um, you know, how fanatically the lady, the lady was dancing and just checked my mother. Similarly, um, we also have uh, here, in, uh, you know, in the Western world, like the Harinas being led uh, by, you know, ladies. They, they like, please just go in the front and dance, then the men lead it, like, Men, men follow them, um, which I feel bit, you know, very confident you go in the front and dance before. Is it how it was before in the roads and the public places, like ladies go dancing in the front, front and men follow? Is it how it used to be or how will it should be your vision and advice? Well, this is something which has been introduced in recent times and uh, you know, some parts of the world, like Russia, Eastern Europe, they have this thing, you know, that they let the ladies come and dance. But it's not, it wasn't really, it wasn't customary during Prabhupada's time. We never saw this. But there were lady dancers, just like at Jagannath Puri, we hear about dramas which were per performed there in Jagannath Puri and how Ramananda Roy, he would train these young girls to dance. You know, you, but the, the, the point is also that these dancers were very young girls. You don't let, you know, older women come and start dancing and, <laughs> you know, making a show in front of a lot of men. So, it's certainly, this is a controversial point, Maharaji, you brought up. There is some uh, different opinions about this. Some people, they think this is good, yeah, let the ladies do it, you know, they'll attract people and like, you know, let the ladies go in front and dance. But not everybody's in favor of this. Some people, they think it's good and they get people interested. People like it, and other people they don't like it. They think this is not Vedic culture. It, 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 that kind of uh, behavior directly um, contradicts what Prabhupada says here. It enhances their beauty and prestige, even if they're less important family. You know, so that, that shyness is ultimately even more attractive. Yeah. Of course, a lot depends on how they dress. We often find, you know, women are not so much familiar with covering the body. Although they wear a sari, and the sari is meant to cover the body, they often don't do it. It doesn't facilitate in the dancing and moving their arms around. One time Prabhupada was on a flight, Indian Airlines flight, so the air stewardess was in a sari, and when Prabhupada came off the plane, the air stewardess, she took her sari, 
and she, lift, she put it over the head of Prabhupada to protect him from the sun. But Prabhupada was shocked. He thought, he thought this is not proper. She shouldn't do like this. This is not chastity. That she's just lifting her sari and exposing her body. You know, the mood, you know, although she's offering service to Prabhupada, but Prabhupada didn't appreciate it. He thought this is not the proper behavior for a woman, chaste woman. Maharaj, yes? I had one, one, one point, that a comment. Um, in the mid-80s, um, Satchit Maharaj, who had so much association with Prabhupada, gave a Bhagavatam class which prompted me to ask a question. Um, I was the Sankirtan leader in um, the Washington temple, and most of the money that was coming in the temple was something that I organized, you know, through the Sankirtan. And um, the temple treasurer was a lady, and it was so difficult to get her to give any money, like for maintaining the vans or anything. It was just like super intense. So I asked Satsuru Maharaj, how did Prabhupada feel about women being in leadership positions? And uh, he said that Prabhupada was not at all inclined because the men would feel uncomfortable. And um, that's exactly how I felt at that time. And um, apparently Prabhupada never placed any woman in, woman in a leadership position, whether it be temple president, as you said, GBC, you know, Damuna, uh, what Tom Krishnamar said. And then I recently was in a temple and worked under a lady temple president. And whew, boy, was it ever uncomfortable <laughs> for me. I'm not saying it in a critical way, but just descriptive based upon this principle, you know, the, of shyness. And um, this was just kind of the opposite of that, you know, my experience in that situation. So anyway, now, there's a tendency to kind of catch up with Western culture that's developed within our movement, at least in, in America, maybe in other places. And um, I, I really feel it goes against what Prabhupada taught. Even to use the word mataji, I would get chastised for that. You know, no, Prabhu. <laughs> <laughs> really heavy, huh? No, Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, I think that you've made a good point there, that, we, that they think we have to catch up with Western culture rather than un understand what is the real culture we're presenting. The rationale behind it was that otherwise a um, modern woman wouldn't be attracted to join. But it wasn't a way that, that wasn't that way with Prabhupada when he was present, you know, when he was really pushing Vedic standards. Okay, we have to go on. Thank you, Jan Mastami Prabhu. Okay, so then we hear at that time Arjuna, intimate friend of Lord Krishna, took up an umbrella. So we saw that photograph with that painting, beautiful painting, Arjuna, uh, Arjuna carrying the umbrella over the head of Lord Krishna, the white umbrella. And Uddhava and Satyaki begin to fan the Lord. So this is actually the deity worship. This is the system for the Dwapara Yuga, which was deity worship. You can see Arjuna holding the umbrella over the head of the Lord and Uddhava and Sanyaki fanning the Lord. That's the system in the previous Yuga. And then we had... Uh, all right, so... The, bene the benedictions being paid to Krishna. Well, we hear about the. <laughs> they're giving benedictions to Krishna. Neither befitting nor unbefitting, because they were all for the Absolute. Yeah, you give a benediction to Krishna. Krishna is Bhagavan, he has everything. So I've noted here. Uh, therefore, the sounds of benedictions uttered by the learned brahmanas here and there appear to be contradictory in relationship with the absolute person. But when they are applied to the absolute person, they lose all contradiction and become transcendence. So that's the point. Whatever benedictions we give to Krishna is transcendence. 
All right? And so then we hear about the, the words offered by the ladies on the rooftops of Hastinapur, that they're talking, remember, the transcendental qualities of Lord Krishna, and this talk was more attractive than the hymns of the Vedas. Why would it be more attractive than the hymns of the Vedas? Yes, Prabhu? Yes, that's one point, right? Any other points? Well, the ladies on the tops of the houses in the capital of the kings of of the king of the Kuru dynasty were talking about the Lord. Their talk was more pleasing than the Vedic hymns. And Prabhupada explains, anything sung in the praise of the Lord is Shruti Mantra. So the talks of the ladies, this is, is, this is more pleasing than the Vedic hymns because the Vedic hymns are uttered just simply by the Brahmanas. They may not have the feeling of devotion, but these words of the ladies, this is coming from their heart. This is their, the, the representation of their love and devotion and appreciation for Lord Krishna. So the language of the, the ladies of Hastinapur is more pleasing than just these hymns of the Vedas. Prabhupada said, the language is immaterial but the subject matter is important. The ladies were all absorbed in the thought and actions of the Lord, developed by the consciousness of Vedic wisdom, by the grace of the Lord. So the people reciting Vedic hymns, they're not going to be like that. They just, it's more mechanical recitation. But here's the lady, the ladies are speaking from the heart. And they're absorbed in thought and action of the Lord. So it's so wonderful. All right? So more pleasing than the Vedic hymns. Uh, he, the original Lord, they glorify Him. That uh, He's the cause of the creation. He's the, everything comes from Him. The living entities are placed under the guidance of material nature, by its own potency, material nature is empowered to recreate. So describing the ladies of Astinapur are speaking the philosophy, describing about the nature of material creation. And they say, here is the same Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose transcendental form is experienced by great devotees who are cleansed of all material consciousness by dint of rigid devotional service and full control of life and the senses. That is the only way to purify existence. So the ladies have really understood what you have to do to purify existence. You have to perform devotional service. You have to control the mind and senses then we can actually awaken this real love for Krishna. Here is the very personality of Godhead whose attractive and confidential pastimes are described in the confidential parts of Vedic literature. All right, the confidential parts of the Vedic literature are Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly 10th Canto, in the Vedanta Sutra or Upanishads, there is only a hint of the confidential parts of his pastimes. Hmm? But his form, name, quality and paraphernalia have been elaborately distinguished from matter and therefore he is sometimes misunderstood by less intelligent persons as impersonal. If you just read the Upanishads, then we'll think like that. We'll think the Lord is impersonal. But when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, we can understand very clearly he's a person. And he has qualities, and he has associates, and he has energies, and he has pastimes. 
We have to hear from the proper source. So we say, Vedeshu Durlabham, Adurlabham Atma Bhakto. Very difficult to know the, the Lord by the Vedas, but very easy to know Him by the devotees. So Prabhupada talks about hearing from the Mahajans, and he, in the purport he mentions the names of all the Mahajans. And he explains that, that we want to hear, he said, the confidential parts of his activities are described by the confidential devotee, Sukadeva Goswami. So this Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken by Sukadeva Goswami. He is able to describe the confidential parts. We're going to hear about some of the confidential activities of the Lord. So the next verse, the ladies of Hastinapur, they talk about the kings and the administrators, that if they live like animals, they're in the lowest modes of existence. But the transcendental form of the Lord then performs wonderful activities, manifests various transcendental forms as is necessary in different periods and ages. So the ladies are describing how the Lord appears in different forms, different places, performs different activities, wonderful activities, right? What are some of the superhuman acts of Lord Krishna? You know, usually we will always mention, He lifted the Govardhan hill. What are some of the other superhuman activities of Lord Krishna? Maybe you can give one, Murli Manohar. Establishing Dharma through the Bhagavad Gita. Spoke the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Where? Healing of cancer. Kurukshetra. Kur we, we want, no, no, superhuman activity. Somebody may say, oh, I spoke the Bhagavad Gita, you know, I could also write my book, you oh, know. Yeah. Sorry, Maharaj, I misunderstood. So, um, he married 16,108 wives. Yes, thank you. That's a good superhuman activity, right. Yes. Chandrika Maharaji, you have your hand up. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, he bridged the Indian Ocean. As Lord Rama, he crossed the Indian Ocean. He made a bridge, right, to go across the ocean. All right, thank you. And Rasa Sekar? Well, yeah, he killed some demons. But you get mass murderers, they kill, you know, they come and kill people. Okay. Yes, Any, anybody else? Okay. Sri Ram, Sri Ram Nitai. He appeared from a stone for his devotee, Bhakta Prahlad. He appeared from a pillar. Okay. Yes. In order to protect Bhakta Prahlad, he, uh, not Bhakta Prahlad, but Prahlad Maharaj. Bhakta means a new devotee. We could say Raja Bhakta, but I shouldn't just say Bhakta Prahlad, but uh, Prahlad Maharaj. Prabhupada writes in Chaitanya Charitamrita that Bhakta means neophyte devotee. So Prahlad is not a neophyte devotee. If we say Bhakta Prahlad, it's not correct. He's a Raja Bhakta, or he's Prahlad Maharaj, right? So Lord Nasringadeva appeared from a pillar. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. And Vinay Damada. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, Sri Krishna saved Pratikshit Maharaj within the womb of Uttra. Oh, okay. We may have difficulty to, to support that, that, how do we know that was actually Krishna who saved him in the womb? A little tricky to prove that. 
Or anyway, he performs many wonderful superhuman activities. And then we hear about uh, Lord Krishna's con conjugal love. Particularly, we hear about Lord Krishna accepting 16,100 ladies. These 16,100 ladies are described, and they're described as fallen ladies. Why are they considered fallen? Yes, Sachitanai? Okay. So, Vinay Damodar Prabhu, maybe you can explain to me what's the very custom, what makes a woman fallen and a woman not fallen, what's the difference? Well, a uh, woman, because women should be uh, protected uh, in childhood uh, by father and uh, then husband and then uh, a son. So if women is uh, out of uh, their protection, then they are uh, considered as fallen because in those cases, these women were out of the protection of uh, their father and they have to stay nights in protection of uh, that king. That's why. Right. Yeah. So their chastity is damaged, right? They've, yes, they've lost their chastity. Can you give some other examples like that? Women lost their chastity and were rejected? Uh, Maharaj, uh, for uh, people say about Sita Maharani also. Okay, people say Sita Maharani was taken by Ravan. Yes, okay. Mahavirya Prabhu, Mahavirya Rupa Prabhu. Any other example? Amba, Ambika, Ambarika. Oh, yes, right, that's what I was thinking also. Yes. Bhishma kidnapped the three sisters and brought them for wives for Vichitravirya. But one of them said, which one said, I've already, I'm already engaged, I already have a, a fiancé. And so he told her, then go back, you go back to your fiancé. And when she went back to her fiancé, he said, no, I don't want you now, you've been touched by another man. Don't want anything to do with you now, you go. So she came back to Bhisma and said, you ruined my marriage, you should marry me now. <laughs> it's a problem for Bhisma. Okay, so six, 16,100 ladies were considered fallen by society. They'd been put in the, in the palace or in the prison of Bomasura for his enjoyment. And Lord Krishna accepted all of them as his wives. Why? Nobody will marry them. What? Kamalangi Madhiji, what do you say? Kamalangi, are you speaking something? Krishna to get married. 
Yeah, let me see some hands. You want to answer, you want to speak something better, you raise your hand. All right, so Rajasheikh, you want to say something, Rajasheikhar? What is it? Hare Krishna Maharaj, because of uh, the sincerity of purpose, because they, they were sincere in prayer, that's why the Lord had married them. They, they offered prayers, they offered sincere yeah. prayers. Yes, Maharaj. And the Lord reciprocates with the desires of his devotees. If somebody wants to be the husband of the Lord, the, if somebody wants the Lord to be their husband, the Lord is happy to accept them as his wife. So of course all of these ladies, were they just ordinary women? Who were all these ladies who became Krishna's wives? Yes, some, we will ask some Mataji to answer. Some Mataji can tell us who are these 16,100 ladies? Do you know their identity? Yes. Of Lakshmi? Yes, right. They're all expansions of the Goddess of Fortune, Lakshmi. Yes. And so they were not ordinary ladies, but they were put into this position. They were kidnapped, taken from their father's home, put into the prison house of Bhomasura, and Lord and they prayed to Lord Krishna to deliver them. And the Lord came and he killed Bhomasura and then he accepted all the ladies as his wives. And he married each and every woman. And Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto describes how the Lord expanded himself and at the same time they performed the Vivaha Yagya for each and every lady. And Nanda Maharaj and Ma uh, uh, Vasudeva Devaki, the mother and father of Krishna, they also came to the wedding and they also expanded themselves so that they could take part in the Lord's weddings. So all these weddings were performed at the same time. So this is the inconceivable potency of the Lord, that he can perform all these wonderful activities. So what about the Lord's uh, conjugal affairs, right? Can you say something about the Lord's conjugal love? Do you know anything about the, the different Aspects, you know, is, is the Lord's pastime in Dwarka the same as the pastimes in Vrindavan? Who can comment on this? Any hands are up? What about Murari Prabhu? You haven't said anything today? Do you know about the Lord's pastimes in Vrindavan and the Lord's pastime in Dwarka? Is there, are they the same? The conjugal love? Yeah, the, the pastime is in Vrindavan, there are more, uh, how to say, uh, the, the devotees there, they do not know the, uh, who was actually it, but the, but the uh, ladies in Varaka, they know, Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but the gopis, they knew him just uh, a cover boy. So it was more intimate uh, relation with the Lord. Okay. Thank you. Yes, there's more intimacy in Vrindavan because the gopis in Vrindavan, they simply know Krishna as a cowherd boy. They're not thinking of him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But in Dwarka, they have more understanding. Another point also about a different, another point, there's some, another important point that in Vrindavan, Krishna is not married to the gopis, but in Dwarka, he's married. He's married to these queens of Dwarka. So there's 
Parakya Rasa in Vrindavan and Swakya Rasa in Dwarka. So that is a big difference there in the conjugal pastimes of the Lord. Parakya and Swakya. The Swakya married life is, you know, the not so much, uh, not so much intimacy, not so much. <laughs> Maybe it's not, it's not quite the same, right? After the, the, the greatest pleasure comes before the marriage. After marriage then, oh, yeah, my wife, yeah. But before the marriage, it's very different. There's more excitement, more uh, emotion, more, ex more feelings there. The intensity is greater. So Lord Krishna enjoys, in, enjoys the greatest love in Vrindavan, but at the same time he also enjoys family life in Dwarka with all of these wonderful queens who are expansions of the goddess of fortune. So we're, we're also told about the, inhab the wonder of Dwarka. Text number 27 describes, Undoubtedly it is wonderful that Dwarka has defeated the glories of the heavenly planets and has enhanced the celebrity of the earth. And so the earth has become famous because of Dwarka. So what is so wonderful about Dwarka? Or Prabhupada talks about holy places. He talks about Vrindavan, Mathura and Dwarka. No Mayapur, <laughs> just only Vrindavan, Mathura and Dwarka. These three places are highlighted. So what is so special about these holy places? Why is this Dwarka? Why is this Dwarka better than the heavenly planets? Right, text twenty-seven. Any answers? Why? Why the, these ladies are glorifying Dwarka as being better than the heavenly planets? Could you? You know, usually people they want to go to heaven. But Dwarka is even better than the heavenly planets. Why? Yes. Who is this? Because at that place, uh, when you do devotional activities, many fold. There are uh, uh, devotional activities, uh, many more times, uh, and you get direct association of the Lord. At the Lord you do. Because the uh, uh, place and Lord is same. The place and the Lord is the same. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Dham. The Dham. Dham and the Lord. What, what is the significance of the Dham? Dham means the place where the Lord resides eternally. He's living there eternally. Of course. Sometimes he's manifest, sometimes he's not. If in the Brihad Bhagavad Amrita describes the difference between Goloka and Gokula. Now what's the difference? In Goloka, the Lord is always visible there in Goloka. In Gokula, sometimes he's visible. It's, it, he's there, but sometimes he's visible, sometimes he's not. So Dwarka is also like that. We say Dwarka Dham, Mayapur Dham, Vrindavan Dham. It means the Lord resides there eternally. He's, re he's living there eternally. It's his residence, his abode. So what about heaven? Is the Lord there? Anybody? 
Doesn't, doesn't the Lord go to heaven? Anybody? Hare, Hare Krishna. Yes? Hare Krishna. Can you hear me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, are you hearing me? Can you answer? Yes, Maharaj, heaven planet is within this 14 planet, within this Brahmanda. And, and so what are, these are all planets in spiritual planet. Well, Dwarka is here in this world. Yeah, that's true, but Dwarka is Lord Krishna's eternal abode. Yes, Prabhupada, what does Prabhupada give the example? He said, like an, the, the embassy of the spiritual world, right? Like the, you go to the consulate, if you go to the American consulate, you're in India, you go to American consulate, it's like being in America. You go to the Russian consulate, it's like being in Russia. You go to Chinese consulate, it's like being in China. And you go to Dwarka, it's like being in the spiritual world. Dwarka is also there in the spiritual world. But the Dwarka here in this world is like the embassy of the Dwarka there, non-different. So living there in the Holy Land, in Dwarka, certainly very powerful. Why? Why is it so good to live in these holy places like Dwarka or Vrindavan? What's the benefit? What benefit do you get? Do not come back to the material world. Well, you... It's... Back to the material world. Huh? You're not come back to the material world. Well, you, you may not know you're in the spiritual world. You may not know. You've got... You've you got to have some understanding about the place you're living there. You don't just physically, you don't, Prabhupada said, you don't go to Vrindavan just by buying a ticket to go there. How do we actually enter, how can we actually enter the Dham? Yeah, we have to change our consciousness. Who, who is a wonderful example of a person entering the Holy Dham? In the 10th canto it describes Akrura coming to Vrindavan, right? He's coming to Vrindavan to get Krishna and Balaram, going to bring them to Mathura. And Akrura is thinking how he's so fortunate, he comes to Vrindavan. And then what happens when he gets to Vrindavan? What happens? Anybody? They were thinking that it is Krishna. Huh? He was thinking. The inhabitants were thinking that the gopis were thinking that he is Krishna. No, 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 no. Not a Krura. Oh, sorry, it was a doubt. No, Akrura came to Vrindavan and he saw Krishna's footprints on the ground. He recognized it, all the marks of Krishna's footprints on the ground and he rolled in the dust, took the dust of the dam all over his body. And Prabhupada said, this is how you enter the dam. Right? So, you have, we have to purify our consciousness like that. And we come in the holy dam, it's a place where we can remember Krishna. Remembrance of Krishna is so much easier in the Holy Dham because there's so many places of Krishna's pastimes. Just like here in Mayapur also, we have places of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And, we should all, and these pastimes are going on here eternally. The, the pastimes are going on. We, we may not see them, but they're going on. Krishna's dance. Krishna dances Rasa Leela every night in Vrindavan. The Rasa Stala empties every night. Nobody stays there because they know Krishna's coming. <coughs> Krishna's coming. 
Krishna is coming to dance Rasalila. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada was staying here in Mayapur. He went out in the night and he, he actually met the Sankirtan party of Lord Chaitanya. It's here, it's going on eternally. But we have to be pure in consciousness to see it. So this is a, in this place, in the Holy Dham, it's so much easier to remember Krishna. And, and also, you get a lot of benefit doing devotional service. You get more benefit here. I'll, I'll just see some of the quotes I've, I've marked here. Dwarka, oh, oh. three places, namely Vrindavan, Mathura and Dwarka are more important than the famous planets within the universe. Dwarka is certainly more important than the heavenly planets because whoever has been favoured with the smiling glance of the Lord shall never come back again to this material earth which is certified by the Lord himself as a place of misery. So whoever has been favoured with the smiling glance of the Lord, where are we going to get that favour? We, of course we get that, you go and see the deities. I hope the deity will smile at you when we go there to see the deity. Not only this earth, but all the planets of the universe are places of misery, because in none of the planets would there, is there eternal life. Okay, because devotional, because devotional service in these three places is magnified, those who go there to follow the principles in terms of instructions imparted in the revealed scriptures surely achieve the same result as obtained during the presence of Lord Sri Krishna. His abode and he himself are identical in a pure devotee under the guidance of another experienced devotee can obtain all the results, even at present. So this is the wonder of the Holy Dham. Certainly people who go there are very fortunate. Just like people who were able to be with Lord Krishna 5,000 years ago, certainly they were very fortunate. So the ladies of Astinapur, they glorify about the, the Lord's queens in Dwarka, how they were so fortunate to be his wives, to live with him like a wife, and to enjoy tasting the nectar from the lips of the Lord, and to serve the Lord. And they talk about the gopis, the, the damsels of Brajabhumi, would faint, they would often faint just by expressing such favours. So this is the wonderful prayers of the ladies of Astinapur. We hear, they mention about the children of the, the different queens. We'll hear more tomorrow about the queens, the eight principal queens of Lord Krishna. Okay, so... All right, uh, we talk about the 16,100 queens who were taken from Bomasura after Lord Krishna had killed Bomasura. He was able to uh, marry each of them. And text number 30 said, All these women auspiciously glorified their lives despite their being without individuality and without purity. They'd lost their purity, but they glorified their lives. Their husband, lotus-eyed Lord Krishna, never left them alone at home. And Lord Krishna describes how Lord Krishna would please them as a husband. How he was very, uh, like, he acted sometimes like a henpecked husband, following them around and smiling at them, pleasing them. Prabhupada writes, women, merchant and labourers are not very intelligent. Thus it is very difficult for them to understand the science of God or to be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. They are more materialistic and less than them are, and then Prabhupada mentions all these different races of people who are addicted to sinful acts, 
But he said, all of them can be delivered if they are properly engaged in devotional service of the Lord. And then Prabhupada talks more about their sincerity of purpose made them at once pure by virtue of devotion. The Lord therefore accepted them as his wives and thus their lives became glorified. So the, the, their sincerity of purpose. Krishna knows the heart of everyone. Of course, he's the super soul in everyone's heart. So he knows the sincerity of purpose behind everyone. So in this way the ladies are glorifying Lord Krishna as he's leaving Hastinapur. And we hear Maharaj Yudhisthira follows Lord Krishna out of the city. He accompanies him some distance. He doesn't want to leave him. But Lord Krishna tells Maharaj Yudhisthira, you have to go back. And the Lord, for some time, he's playing the part of a subordinate in his transcendental sporting. Puts himself in the care of Yashodananda for the protection and his so-called helplessness of childhood. Right? We talked about that. Okay, so Maharaj Yudhisthira is sent back, Lord Krishna continues and he goes on, finally he reaches to Dwarka. And, and we're told how when the Lord is travelling at different places, he would perform his evening rites. And it's mentioned, Prabhupada talks about the importance of being the example, the way of teaching properly is to show by example. Sometimes, however, he does something extraordinary, not to be imitated by the living being. Just like Lord Krishna dances Rasa Leela and he picks up the Govardhan Hill. We cannot imitate these things. Prabhupada said, one cannot imitate the sun, which can exhaust water even from a filthy place. The most powerful can do something which is all good, but our imitation will put us into endless difficulty. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Anyone? Yes, Prabhu? Yes. What, what are you asking for? Well, there's a little booklet you can get which describes the significance of all of these different symbols. I suggest you go and get the, the booklet. It, it was published some time ago by Mahanidhi Swami. But it's all about all these different symbols and mentions each and every symbol and tells you the significance. It's a very good book, very interesting. And it has all, the, has all the symbols and it tells you their location and their significance. And it's a translation of a book by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Some years ago, Mahanidhi Swami put the book out. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, in text 28 in Prabhupada's purport, uh, written that uh, the Lord, text 28. Yes. Written that the Lord stayed at Vrindavan till the age of 16, and his friendly relationship with the neighboring girls when in, were in terms of Parakya. Yeah. As far as I know, uh, when Akrura came 
with invitation to Mathura, Krishna and Balram left Vrindavan at the age of 11. If I am not wrong, please uh, correct it. Well, there may be some mistakes here, some errors, and these things can be corrected. Jayadvera Swami didn't like to edit anything anymore because he got so much criticism when, when he edited the Bhagavad Gita. So many people complained. So, you know, it's not a big issue, you know, what age was Lord Krishna when he left Vrindavan? I don't personally know myself exactly the age. What's important to know is that the Lord did leave Vrindavan and how he left Vrindavan. You know, what was the age? You know, Prabhupada wrote these purports a very long time ago. This is the first canto. Prabhupada was living in, in, in Delhi. He published the book on his own. And so he was working alone at that time, doing everything, and letterpress. And so he didn't get a lot of time to check on everything. So I, I don't know if it's right or not. But is it very important to you? You see, I, I made the point, you see, that this is, we're not doing an, a study on information, but transformation. Yes, that, that's true, but uh, Prabhupada also mentioned in 10th canto, in a crude section, uh, when Krishna Bhagavan left Vrindavan, he was about 11 years. That's where the doubt came. Okay. And it's not a critical point, not a crucial point. It's not going to change anything. Anyway, thank you for the information. Certainly, sometimes it's good to know these things. There are different Opinions, sometimes we find something, some mistake here and there. Hmm. As I said, Jayadweda Swami, he, he knew there was a lot of editing to be done in the Bhagavatam. He didn't want to touch it because it's such a sensitive thing. People are so sensitive. Oh, how you can change anything, Prabhupada's words, how you can do it. So he just left it. But maybe if you go to BBT, you know, if you go to the BBT and you, 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 they have a whole list of compilation of all the different errors which are there and you can check for yourself. People who do translation work, they are often given the list of all these errors and they can, when they're translating into another language, they can correct these different kinds of mistakes. Okay? All right, any other question, comment? All right, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Bye. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Bye. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, okay.